Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to, yes, a part two. I actually decided to go through with this. So uh, we're going to have a part two of this particular series that is focusing on AP Chemistry. We're still in unit number one, uh, but our focus today is going to be on average atomic mass and mass spectroscopy. So we're going to be getting a better understanding of how we know molar masses on the periodic table. Like, where does that information come from? How do scientists actually go through and research that? And then uh, before we even get into that, we're just going to be doing some mathematical calculations related to the average atomic mass. So given a set of data, how do we utilize that information to either calculate the average atomic mass or calculate percent abundance of a particular isotope in a given sample? So if you're interested in that, feel free to stay tuned. Uh, like I said, very excited to be here, very excited to continue this series and uh, you know scratch that creative itch, get that creative outlet out there, and hopefully provide some assistance to some students in some AP chemistry topics that might be a little more on the complex side. So again, excited to have you here and we will go ahead and get started. So just a little bit about the learning objectives, what I would expect you to hopefully get out of this is, uh, and again, this, this harkens back to what we've talked about at the very beginning of this particular video series, is that the mole allows for different units to be compared with one another. Moles allows the ability for us to convert uh, grams into something that we can utilize to compare individual uh, compounds in a chemical reaction to determine how much product is produced from a reaction. Remember that the only way that we can transform chemicals third-dimensional analysis uh, is through moles, and we're going to be utilizing that and understanding where some of these numbers come from. Uh, and then the second here is the average atomic mass of an element can be estimated from a weighted average. We'll talk more about that term here in just a little bit, uh, but it is the weighted average of isotopic masses utilizing the mass of each isotope and its relative abundance. So uh, a weighted average is very similar to how a lot of grades are calculated. You may see on a college syllabus or, or uh, you know, even just a high school syllabus itself, um, that your, your grade is weighted. That is, instead of it being necessarily points-based, you know, your grade might be 65% exams, meaning that the final grade that you receive, 65% of the points that you end up earning come from exams and 25% from labs and then from homework and you know whatever. So we're going to utilize those concepts in the weighted average of isotopic masses. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to take a look at today, which is something that's probably new to you, is what is known as a mass spectrum or mass spectroscopy. And um, it can be determined to, or used rather, to determine the identity of isotopes of an element and the relative abundances of each isotope in nature. So if we take a look at the graph on the right-hand side here, uh, the masses of isotopes are given down in the bottom right-hand, I'm sorry, the bottom side, I, pff, duh, Joe, uh, call it the x-axis. <laughs> The masses are on the x-axis and the relative abundance is on the y-axis. So we can actually utilize this information to go through and calculate average atomic masses. But again, more on that in just a little bit once we get through average atomic mass. So when we look at the molar masses that are present on the periodic table, we find that they are weighted averages of all of the possible isotopes of an element. And a weighted average is just going to be calculated by taking the mass of each individual isotope and multiplying it by the abundance of the isotope and adding them all together. So very similar to how a weighted grade is calculated, we would take the amount of points that you earned in each individual category, and then we would multiply it by the percentage. So for example, 65% of your grade is exams. So we would take however many points you earned um, at, at in that particular category, and we would multiply that by the 0.65, and that would give us a relative number, and then we would utilize all those relative numbers and add them together, and that would calculate your final grade in the class. We're gonna do the exact same thing in order to calculate the average atomic mass, again, by taking the mass of each individual isotope, and then we're gonna multiply it by the abundance, or the percentage of the isotope, and then add them all together in order to get our average atomic mass that's found on the periodic table. Uh, the unit for the average atomic mass, once you go through and do the calculation, will either be an AMU, atomic mass unit, which refers to the mass of each individual atom uh, within the sample, or uh, grams per mole, which would refer to a mole of a sample, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms in the sample. But if I take a look at the example at the very bottom here, 
We can calculate the average atomic mass of magnesium. We have three different individual isotopes with three different masses, uh, one that's 23.985, one that is 24.986, and one that is 25.982 AMU, and you're given the relative percentages on the outside. Notice that when we go through and we do the calculation, we keep the masses the same, the relative AMU, but when we multiply that by the abundance, and the abundance is the percentage in its decimalized form. So remember when we decimalize a percentage, we divide it by 100, remove the decimal place over two spots, so it ends up being 0.7899 rather than 78.99. And we add them all together and we get the average atomic mass. Now one easy way that we can go through and check our work related to average atomic mass is to ensure that whatever we get for the weighted average is somewhere in between the highest and lowest value for mass for each of the isotopes. So for example, the answer we get is 24.31 AMU, which is somewhere in between 23.985 and 25.982. In addition to that, we can get kind of a rough estimate of where the average atomic mass should be based off of the abundance of each isotope. So I noticed that isotope number one is uh, in abundance of nearly 80%, meaning that nearly 80% of the sample is isotope number one. Well, what that tells me is that the average atomic mass should be closer to that of isotope number one than of isotope number two or isotope number three. And we can see that that is the case here as well. So there's a couple of different context clues that we can go through and utilize in order to determine uh, whether we've gone through and gotten the right answer. One of the things that I like to do when we do math in science class is not only go through and do the work and, and make sure we round up proper sig figs and all that kind of stuff, but in addition to that, Ask yourself, is the answer feasible? Is the answer something that is even possible as a result of this? And utilizing some context clues from the problem, we can determine if a, uh, an answer is something that is logical, something that is feasible. So uh, we'll do probably a practice problem or two here in just a moment, and then we will get to the mass spectroscopy part. So we have a practice problem here where we are going to be looking at determining the average atomic mass for neon here. Uh, so we have all the given information that we need in the problem in order to be able to solve for this. Remember, we are going to take the mass of each individual isotope, multiply it by the percentage as a decimal, and then we're just going to add them all up together. If we do this correctly, the average atomic mass should be somewhere between roughly 20 and 22. And again, I can get a rough estimate of that because the percentage of neon 20 is nearly 90%. So the average atomic mass is going to be much closer to 20 than it would be to 21 or 22. So let's go through and do some of the math here, all right? So we're gonna take 19.9924. We're gonna multiply that by 0 0.9048. Remember those percentages need to be decimalized. Add to that 20.9938. That needs to be decimal, so it needs to be 0 0.002710. Almost made a critical error. And then uh, 21.9914 times 0 0.09253. Okay. And we're just going to plug those into our calculator and get an answer. And what I end up with here when I am done is 20.18. Uh, and again, AMU is perfectly acceptable for this, or you could also use grams per mole because, again, this number not only refers to the mass or the average atomic mass of an individual uh, atom or isotope, it also is how many grams there are in a mole of something. So simple math. Hopefully no problems with that. Let's move on and do one more practice problem before we move on to mass spectroscopy. All right, so just another bit of a... Uh, all right, so just another style of average atomic mass problem. We're going to be utilizing neon with this as well. Um, notice that it gives us the average atomic mass here of 20.18 AMU, and it gives us the masses of those relative isotopes. And what it asks us to do is to calculate the percentage abundance of each individual isotope. Well, this is going to be a little bit tricky because um, we're not really given a whole lot of information about any of the percentages. So we're going to, have to do a little bit of work here in order to figure this out. There's two things that I know that are true. Um, let's go ahead and call X um, the percentage for neon 20, and then let's call Y the percentage for neon 22. All right? The two things I do know is that if I take 19.99, multiply that by X, add that 21.99, 
multiplied by y, I will get the average atomic mass of 20.18. What I also need to recognize as I go through and do this problem is that there are only two naturally occurring isotopes of neon based on the information in the problem. What that tells us is that I can actually set up another system of equations where x plus y is equal to 1, right? Is that there are only two naturally occurring isotopes, then the percentages of those two isotopes have to add up to be 100. So now what I have here is a system of equations that I can utilize and then plug in one for the other and algebraically solve for the percent abundance of one of the isotopes and then subtract from 100 the other percentage and um, then I'll get the, I'll have both. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange this second equation here. Let's go ahead and solve for x. So you're going to subtract y on both sides. So x is now going to equal 1 minus y. And now I can plug this in algebraically for x and then solve for y. So what I end up with is 19.99 1 minus y plus 21.99 times y equals 20.18. A little bit of distributive property of math. So 19.99 minus 19.99y plus 21.99y equals 20.18. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're just going to combine like terms and divide. So when I combine like terms, I'm going to end up with 2y racing here. Sorry, you're not going to see that for long. Um, but what I'm going to up with is 2y and then 20.18 minus 0.19. Divide that by 2 and what that tells me is that my value for y is 0 0.095 or in a percentage 9.5% which means that my x is going to be 90.5% because the percentages have to add up to be 100. Okay, so it's a little bit trickier style of problem, but the one thing you need to remember here is that there's two things that we can say are true. That very first equation up at the top where we talked about average atomic mass, and then underneath it, we can recognize that uh, whatever the percentages are, they have to add up to equal 100. So utilizing that information, we can go through it and algebraically solve for this. It's a definitely a trickier style of problem, uh, but again, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of practice, and you'll be really, really good with this. All right, let's move on to mass spectrometry. So one of the questions I get asked quite often is how do we know this information about average atomic mass? How do we determine the percentages of the isotopes that are present in any given sample? And mass spectrometry or mass spectroscopy, I've heard it called both ways, so I'll use both here, uh, is a technique that can actually separate a mixed sample of different isotopes of the same element. So basically what we can do is take that sample that has all of the different isotopes in it and then actually separate them and then based off of how many each individual or how many of each individual isotope we end up having, we can then determine what the percentages are and, and do some math with it. So it's very, very useful to determine compositions of compounds as well as percentage abundance of each isotope in an element. If you do move on to take things like organic chemistry, you'll find that this is actually quite useful um, in not just determining the uh, percentages of isotopes of elements, but helps you understand how certain functional groups are attached to carbon containing compounds. So for example, uh, a methyl group has its own distinct mark on a mass spec. Uh, a carboxylic acid group has a distinct mark on a mass spec. Now we won't get into that much detail in this class. Our primary focus is going to be on individual elements and just getting an understanding of what this graph tells us and what we can utilize uh, the graph for. So how this process works is a substance is typically vaporized and ionized. Basically, it means that we are able to separate them into their individual atoms, and then we ionize them, which gives them a charge. We take these individual charged atoms, and then we run them through an electric or magnetic field, resulting in slight deflections of the ions. The magnitude of the deflection is correlated with the mass of the isotope. The smaller the mass of the isotope, the greater the deflection we end up having. So you can see you've got a sample kind of a beam of particles. You have an electron beam that's there that gives them their ionization. And uh, they accelerate these ions through and then you see that there is a magnet here. And then what it does is based off of the mass, basically it's a mass to charge ratio situation, uh, but we'll just say based on the mass, 
of the individual isotope, it's going to curve through that machine. Um, the heavier ions are going to curve less than the ones that are lighter, and so you end up having distinct marks on this detection screen. So you can see here we have four different isotopes that are present in this sample because we have four distinct markings on the detection screen. Uh, based on the number of hits on the detection screen, computer can work out roughly what the percentage is of each individual isotope within the sample. So as you mentioned before, the detection screen records the relative abundance of each ion type, and then a graph has ended up being produced from this. And then again, we can utilize this information to figure out what's the most abundant isotope. We can do a little bit of math to figure out the average atomic mass of these individual isotopes. There's a lot of really useful information and a really lot of useful tools, or uh, calculations rather, that we can go through and do with this stuff. So as you look at the mass spec graph, I want you to take note of a couple of things. First off, notice that the x-axis is the isotope mass. Sometimes it will refer to it as mass to charge, uh, which is what you see there. You see an M to, to Z. Uh, but you can think of this as the mass of the individual isotopes. So you can see here that our most abundant isotope has a mass of 90, and our least abundant isotope has a mass of 96, or at least of the ones that are present there here. Based on this information and on the y-axis here, we see we have relative abundance. We can then utilize the abundance and the mass to go through and calculate the average atomic mass and determine what element we are actually looking at. So some things that we can do with this information, as we've mentioned before, we can identify elements that are on the periodic table. We can determine the most abundant isotope and estimate an element's identity without calculations. Again, using some, some rough estimates to be able to figure out what the average atomic mass is without having to use a calculator. It's kind of a nice tool, nice little trick to use. So I know we've already talked about this just a little bit, but it's good to be able to go through and um, just do some calculations that are here based off of, whoops, based off of the information that we've already gone through and discussed. Uh, so to determine the molar mass of the element. I'm not gonna do that because I'm really gonna focus more on determining the identity of this. So as we kind of mentioned before, there are three, as I look at this information, try to, to decipher what's going on here, so as I interpret this information, uh, I want to try to do this without actually calculating it, without actually having to go through and do the mathematical calculations, because that's going to save us a little bit of time in the long run. To determine the identity of an element, first thing I'm going to notice here is that my lowest isotope is at 90 and my highest is at 96. And so if I go and I look at the periodic table and look at the average atomic masses, the molar masses that are on the periodic table, I have a couple options here. Um, this can be ZR, which has a molar mass of 91.22. It could be NB, which has a molar mass of 92.91, or this could be molybdenum MO with a molar mass of 95.95, okay? Based solely off the information that I see in the diagram here, I'm going to go ahead and eliminate molybdenum here because there's no way that the average atomic mass is gonna be really, really close to that value. You essentially wanna look at this graph and figure out what's my most abundant isotope and kind of where the average molar mass might lie here. So if I look at this information here, 92.91, that's saying that the average lies right here. Well, I've got a lot more 90 than I do any of the other elements that are here. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross off NB and venture to say that this is probably ZR just based off of the information that's here. Again, if you need to go through and do the math, do the math, there's no problem with that. It's just that sometimes these graphs can be A, a little bit hard to read, uh, and B, it's very time consuming to go through and do that. But if you can take a step back and evaluate these just based off of kind of rough estimates, you're gonna end up saving yourself a lot of time. The last thing it asks us to do here is determine the number of neutrons in the most abundant isotope. Well, if the most abundant isotope is 90, remember that this is the mass number, and that is gonna be equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons that are present. We've established this is ZR, so my proton number in this is actually 40. So you can do a little bit of math here, subtract 40 from 90, and you end up with the neutrons of being 50, okay? So again, utilizing these graphs, utilizing this information to be able to break down a problem, uh, and, and like I said, really get to the meat of what's going on here is very, very important. So make sure that you're able to do all of these things. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of mass spec graphs, but I venture you probably will see maybe one or two um, on the exam. Again, it just depends on 
what the college board's looking for this time around. So um, like I said, take into consideration what we've got going on here and hopefully you don't run into any issues whatsoever. All right, folks, that wraps up video number two in this series. Again, very excited to get back and doing this, this YouTube thing. I don't know, you know how this is gonna turn out, but you know, like I said, that creative itch just really gets to me. I also do see the irony in the fact that it is JLAM Bio, and yet I do not, I don't teach biology anymore. But um, you know, you pick a brand, you stick with it. Really appreciate your time, and hopefully this helped you out in uh, determining average atomic mass and analyzing some mass spec graphs. Have a great day, and we will see you next time. Bye.